Hey, what's up guys, it's Zach. Hey, for the next 20 minutes, we're gonna be talking about prayer. Specifically, we're gonna be talking about what do you do when you've been praying and praying and praying? You've been asking and asking and asking and you still haven't heard from God. What do you do when you're waiting on God or uh, it seems like he's not answering you? We're gonna do our best to uh, find out what God's word has to say about that. Um, I'm a youth pastor in Gainesville, Florida. I might be your youth pastor, or maybe you're just watching this because somebody sent it to you and they thought it might be helpful to you. I hope that it is. But uh, right now, I'm not in Florida, I'm in Denver. Uh, I'm with a group of about 20 of our uh, juniors and seniors from our church in Gainesville, and uh, we've been working with some church plants, some missionaries learning from them and coming alongside them as they uh, try to do what God has called them to do and reach people here in the Denver area. Uh, so this is our spring break, uh, but our crew has been going through a series of messages called Hear Me Out, where you're we're talking about what, what do you do when you're saying to God, hey, hear me out, hear my prayer. How do you pray good prayers? How do you pray uh, effective prayers? Is there a right way? Is there a wrong way? Uh, we've been talking about that. And last week, um, we, we started this conversation as kind of like a uh, introduction, uh, sort of like a, a primer or like an overview of prayer. And uh, uh, that video, that sermon is uh, linked on this YouTube channel, or if you're watching this live in person at collective, then you can go back and watch it on our YouTube. You know how to find that. Um, but we got that conversation started and we were just saying, hey, let's look at the overview of all that the Bible has to say about prayer. Because it says a lot. What does it say about prayer? And we saw that so many Christians in the Bible prayed, so many uh, Jews, people who followed God in the Bible, they prayed in so many different ways and in so many uh, powerful ways. And God answered them in uh, some pretty spectacular ways. And so we were kind of curious, like posing this question, why is it that so, so many Christians today don't pray? They don't take advantage of that opportunity to say, hey God, uh, here's what's on my heart. Uh, you share with me what's on your heart and, and I have these requests. Can, can you answer these requests? We started to ask that question and um, over the next three weeks, we are gonna talk about three different kinds of prayer. Uh, prayers for God, prayers for ourselves, and then prayers for others. There's like biblical, theological words for that. Uh, we call them adoration or praise. And then uh, there's also supplication and intercession. You're gonna learn some pretty big words throughout this series. It's gonna be fun. But right now, like I said, I want us to talk about how to wait on God. How to wait on God, how to hear from Him, uh, how to proceed, what to do, how to think when we still haven't heard an answer maybe on some really big prayers. Um, I think most of us have had a time in our lives, maybe many times, maybe you're going through a time right now where you have a really big prayer request, something that's really important to you. You think, you think it's important to God, but you haven't heard an answer yet. And it's really easy to get impatient. Uh, maybe you get anxious, maybe you get angry with God. Maybe you start doubting whether or not he hears you. Maybe you start wondering, is he even there? And uh, those are, Feelings I think a lot of us relate to really some of the people in the Bible that we respect the most struggled with that. I'll just share a few people. When you look at Genesis 21, you see Abraham and his wife Sarah were waiting for years and years and years to have children. And they had been promised by God that they would have children, that an entire nation was gonna come from them, but still no kids. And so by the time Abraham is 100 years old, 100, he still doesn't have any kids. And his wife, Sarah, at this point is 90 years old and they still don't have any kids. Uh, but then magically, not magically, but miraculously, God gives them a son, a son named Isaac. And then he, he proves himself. He answers his prayer, he keeps his promise. Uh, Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness, 40 years uh, waiting for God uh, before he was finally, uh, before God finally revealed himself to Moses through the burning bush and uh, called him to go and lead the, the uh, Israelites, Moses' people, God's people out of Egypt. You can find that in Exodus chapter three. So Abraham had to wait on God. Uh, Moses had to wait on God. And so did Hannah. Hannah was a, a woman in the Bible who had prayed for years and years and years that God would give her a son. And uh, she had wept and prayed and she had cried out to God. And it says that uh, in 1 Samuel chapter one, that she prayed so passionately and wept so fervently that when she was praying near the, the synagogue, near the temple, that one of the priests, uh, a priest named Eli, he thought that she was drunk. He thought that she was absolutely hammered. Like she is, she's clearly intoxicated. No, 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 she's actually just pouring out her heart to God. So she prayed really, really hard and she still didn't hear from God, but then God answered her prayer and gave her a son named Samuel. 
So this is something that we see all throughout the Bible. Uh, a lot of people had to wait on God. And uh, so if, if you feel like, man, I'm, I'm waiting on God right now. I'm waiting for him to answer uh, a particular prayer. And it's really important to me. Well, you're in good company because some of the, the, the giants, the heroes of the Bible also had to wait on, on God. I want us to talk about David right now, though. We're not going to be long, but I want to talk about David um, because uh, he had a pretty special story. He was a shepherd, then he was a general military leader, then he was a king, uh, and he was somebody that God called a man, this is a man after my own heart. And so I want us to look at his story because David was anointed by Samuel to be king. That is like he was set apart, he was marked, he got like christened, you could say, uh, and, and Samuel told everybody and he told David, you're going to be the next king of Israel. That happened when he was probably about 15, 16, 17 he was the, the youngest in his family. He wasn't quite a grown man. Um, and, and so that probably stirs up a lot of emotions and feelings. Maybe you're a little bit nervous to be king. Maybe uh, you'd be really pumped. You're like, all right, let's go. Keys to the kingdom. Uh, well, one way or another, uh, that didn't happen right away. In fact, it was about 15 years before uh, that prayer was answered, before uh, God actually made him king. And he had to be patient and he had to wait and he probably had to trust God multiple times. He didn't become king until he was 30. And he spent many of those years running from Saul uh, because Saul was a lunatic. Saul was a psychopath. Maybe you know some people who are a little bit crazy, a little bit uh, insane, maybe. Uh, Saul was insane. And he was also David's father-in-law. So you know that probably made some things awkward. Well, David prayed and waited and prayed and waited and prayed and waited. And it, he kept on praying and he kept on waiting until eventually God fulfilled his promise to make him king, to make him king over Israel, just like he said he would. Uh, and so eventually uh, God fulfilled his promise and David became the king of Israel. You can find that in 2 Samuel. But um, I want us to kind of look at some of the things that he said, some of the things that he prayed, um, because I think we can learn a lot from the way that David processed his prayers. And this wasn't the only time that he had to wait on God. There were other times when uh, God was working things out in, in his life that it didn't seem like this is how David would have drawn up the plan if it was left up to him. It doesn't seem like this is how David probably uh, mapped out his life because there were instances when David was running from his life, like I said, from Saul. There were times when his son was betraying him and he had been abandoned and he'd been um, you know, left to, to hang by some of his closest friends and they turned his back on him and he was, you know, he was losing everything, basically. His family, his kingdom, and you know he prayed some desperate prayers. We can read some of those in the Bible. You can look at Psalm 42, for example. Uh, but right now, we're actually going to look at Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Um, because I believe that this was written by David. We're pretty sure it was written by David. Some people are like, well, it doesn't say it was written by David, but I, I'll tell you why I think it was written by David. During this time, we think, I think, that uh, David was serving Saul and getting ready to be the next king, uh, but he had to be patient. And there were times when it wasn't fair. There were times when Saul uh, was being incredibly, I'd just say evil, malicious, um, devious. He was an awful person during this time trying to kill David, his own son-in-law. So look at uh, Psalm 119. You can clap, you can cheer. Psalm 119 whatever you're going to do. Uh, we're excited to look at Psalm 119, and I'm going to start in verse 81. And uh, this is a really cool passage of scripture. Uh, we're not going to read all of Psalm 119. It's a huge passage, but I just want to look at a few of these. Um, starting in verse 81, we're going to learn some things here. He says, my soul faints with longing for your salvation, but I have put my hope in your word. When he says faints, he's like, I'm, I'm almost dead. Like I'm this close. I'm, I'm hanging on by a thread. But I put my hope in your word. My eyes fail looking for your promise. And I say, when will you comfort me? Like I'm, I'm going through this alone, God. It seems like you've abandoned me. Though I am like a wineskin in the smoke, I do not forget your decrees. How long must your servant wait? How long is this going to keep on going? When will you punish my persecutors? He's like, God, I know that you're good. I know that you're fair. I know that you're, you're going to come and save the day somehow, in some way. But how much longer is that going to be? Maybe you feel like you're in a similar situation where you're also waiting for God to make things fair, to, to set things right. The, he says, the arrogant dig pits for me. 
They, it, when, and you're like, what do you mean they, they dig pits? They dig pits. It, he's saying they're, they're digging traps for me in the same way that they would dig traps and maybe put some stakes in the ground in that hole for a wild animal to come. And, you know, they were trying to, maybe they were going to catch a boar or something else that they were going to eat. Like it was, this was, this is how you would catch a live animal if you were hunting them. He says, I'm being trapped. I'm being hunted, God, by evil people. And these people, uh, they don't follow your law. They're contrary to your law. And all your commands are trustworthy. All your instructions, all of your word, God, is, is good. Um, but I have not forsaken. Oh, sorry, I, I skipped a line. He says, all your commands are trustworthy, so help me, for I am being persecuted without cause. He's saying, this isn't fair. Now, I think sometimes we say, God, this isn't fair. And he's like, you want me to tell you what's fair? Okay, you're a sinner, you've broken all my laws, and I'm still, uh, I still love you, I still let you into heaven as so long as you accept my gift of salvation. Like, that's not fair. So I think we got to be careful when we're saying, God, this isn't fair. Maybe you felt that way at one point or another. You're saying, I'm being persecuted without cause. He says, they've almost wiped me from the earth, but I've not forsaken your precepts. So again, he's saying, like, they've almost wiped me from the earth. Uh, I'm almost dead. I'm still, once again, in the same way they said before, um, uh, I'm like wineskin in the smoke. He says, I, my soul faints with, that, with longing for your salvation. He says, I'm this close. I can't take much more. Maybe you're saying something like that to God. Like, God, I, I can't take much more. I'm going to have to quit believing in you. I'm going to have to quit going to church. God, I can only give you so much. Um, I, I don't know if that's where you are tonight, this morning, wherever you are, whenever you're watching this, but uh, I think it's okay to be honest to God. We're, we'll get to that in a second. Let's finish this passage. In verse 88, he says, um, In your unfailing love, preserve my life. God, I know that your love is unfailing. I know that you never give up on me. Preserve my life, that I may obey the statutes of your mouth. There's so much to learn here. There's so much that we could take away here. So I, I don't want us to miss this, but here's uh, just a few observations. Uh, I think that God's timing is not often exactly when we want it. Sometimes it's delayed, not because he likes watching us suffer, not because he wants to just make fun of us or anything like that, but because he wants to sift through our motives. He wants to, to sift through and, and see what our desires really are. And God's delays are not meant to frustrate us, but to strengthen us. And he does this by testing our faith, by testing our patience and the willingness of our heart to be obedient. Uh, I think we see the same kind of thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. Uh, here Paul is talking, he says, we are hard pressed on every side, yet we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. And so Paul is saying the same kind of thing that David is saying in uh, Psalm 119. He's saying, listen, I, I don't know how much more of this I can take, but he's resolving to say, God, I know that you're good. I know that your love is steadfast and it's unfailing. I know you're going to preserve my life because that's who you are. If I could circle back to that verse where uh, David says, listen, I'm like a wineskin in the smoke. What he's saying there is he's like, listen, a wineskin is supposed to be, uh, maybe this word is gross to you, but a wineskin is supposed to be moist. It's supposed to uh, have some elasticity. It's supposed to be able to hold some wine without bursting. If it gets too dry, it's useless. And he says, listen, I'm like a wineskin in the smoke. I'm all dried out. I'm withered. I'm no good anymore. And I think it's interesting. He says, I'm I'm like a wineskin in the smoke, and I, I don't forget your decrees, because it, when Charles Spurgeon was uh, writing about the same passage, he was preaching about the same passage of Scripture. He's a preacher from a long, long time ago. He said this. He says, our trials are smoke, but not fire. They are very uncomfortable, but they do not consume us. They're very uncomfortable. The situation that you're going through, the situation that uh, David is talking about here, I think it's very, very uncomfortable. And I, I don't want to minimize your pain. I don't want to excuse or uh, trivialize your frustrations. And, and maybe you've been waiting a lot longer than I've ever had to wait for an answer to prayer. But I just want to encourage you. I just want to remind you, you're not being destroyed. You're, you're in a place of extreme discomfort. And, and like David keeps resolving here, he says, I don't know how much longer I can take, but I know that you love me. I don't know uh, how much more of this I can handle, but I know that you're still loving and I know that you will preserve my life, right? He's, he's saying this sucks, but you're good. This is awful, but you're still loving. And, and you've got to keep going back and forth. Like you can be honest with God, but you can't attack God. 
In fact, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. I do want to share um, a few, a few uh, points, a few tips, pro tips for when you're waiting on God, so to speak. Here's the first one. You can complain to God, but you can't complain about God. You can complain to God, but not about God. And here's, here's the difference. Um, David isn't really holding back anything here. You look at so many different psalms that he wrote. Uh, there's a lot of similarities between this one and many other psalms that we know David wrote. So that's why I think this is David. Um, but he never holds back. He never goes, God, I'm just, uh, I don't want to complain. I'm no, I don't want to complain, but I'm just not having a very good go at things. He says, I'm not trying to be, um, he, he, he's not sugarcoating this. He says, God, this is the worst. My soul faints. I'm about this close to death and I'm waiting for your, um, for your salvation. I'm waiting. I don't have it. He says, um, I've almost been wiped from the earth. Like that sounds kind of dramatic, right? Unless it's real to you, unless that's the situation that you're actually going through. Maybe some of you guys are like, no, I relate to that. I really do. Um, and so the, the biggest encouragement I have to you is, is share everything that you're going through with your perfect heavenly father who loves you. You don't have to pretend that this is all fine. You don't have to pretend, that you're not going to offend God when you say, hey, this is what I'm going through and this is what it feels like. So when you're waiting on God, go ahead and vent. Now, there, there's a right way to do that and a wrong way to do that. Like I said, you can complain to God. You just can't complain about God. So what you don't get to do, what I would not recommend, if you really want your prayers answered, if you want to honor God, is, is making personal attacks about God to God. So don't go into a time of prayer and say, God, you actually are not good. God, uh, it doesn't seem like you have any power. Maybe you're not the God that I thought you were. I, I wouldn't do that. That doesn't seem to be uh, the way that we're instructed to pray to God, um, uh, the way that um, effective prayers were, were prayed by some of the giants of the faith. And, and that's, not, that's not loving to God. So in, in a moment, we, when, we're, when we're really pressed, we might say some things that we, we don't mean. But as best as you can, I want to encourage you, you can complain to God, but don't complain about God. The next thing I wanted to say was this. Um, we can rant about our trials and tribulations and all the obstacles that we're dealing with, the issues that we're facing, uh, so long as we also recite God's word. So if you're going to rant about your problems, you've also got to recite God's word. You've got to keep it on your heart and keep it on your mind and keep coming back to the truths and the promises of what he says. This is why I, I say, I think this was David, because you look at Psalm 42, you look at so many other Psalms where he is uh, similarly saying, God, this sucks. God, I'm in pain. God, I'm, I'm miserable. I need you. Uh, I need you to rescue me. He keeps this same kind of parallelism. This Psalm in particular is actually an acronym, which is pretty cool, or rather an acrostic. Um, and so they would have all started with the same Hebrew letter each line. It's pretty cool. But um, the point is like, there's, some, there's some, uh, some rhythm here. He says, my soul faints. I don't know how much longer I can take, but I have put my hope in your word. That's verse 81. Um, you know, even though I feel like I'm useless, like I've, I'm all used up, I'm like a wineskin in smoke, I have not forgotten your decrees. So this sucks, but I'm holding on. This is difficult, but I'm not giving up. God, it seems like you're not here, but I know that you're here. So you got to keep like every time you complain to God, you got to remind him and remind yourself, verbalize it, pray it. Say, God, I know that that's not true. It feels like I'm alone, but I know that I'm not alone. It feels like you're, you hate me, but I know you don't hate me. So that is my second piece of encouragement to you. First, like you can complain to God, but don't complain about God. And then secondly, um, Whenever you rant about your trials, you also have to recite God's word. Um, and so uh, that's, that's some encouragement. I've got some like other uh, miscellaneous pieces of information that are sticking out to me here. Um, but the third thing I wanted to point out to you is this. We can, we can launch into a prayer with our pain so long as we land that prayer on God's promises. It's, it's a similar concept, but at the end of this entire prayer, um, you know, David is very clear where he stands. When, he's, when he lands this prayer, when he closes this thought and moves on to another thought, he's, he's saying, listen, um, in your unfailing love, preserve my life. Your love is unfailing. I know that you never give up on me. I know that you don't quit on me. 
Uh, you're not a liar, God. You're going to answer your, uh, my prayer. You're going to keep your promises so that I may obey the statutes of your mouth. Now, that's huge. I don't think that's how most of us pray. What David is saying here as he's waiting on God is, listen, at the end of the day, the reason I want you to answer this prayer is so that I can honor you. Not so that the pain goes away, not so that I'm more comfortable, not so that, you know, things just go the way I want them to. He says, I want you to preserve my life so that I may obey the statutes of your mouth, so that I can follow your commandments, so that I can obey what your word tells me to do in the Bible. That's huge. I don't think most of us are motivated that way. I think most of us are like, ow, God, it hurts, ah, it hurts, ah. I want that. I, I need it. I really, 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 really want that. Like, and I need you to get it for me. I need you to, to give it to me. Like, that's how most of us pray. It's either something that we want him to take away or something he, we want him to give us just so that we have it or just so that it stops hurting. And, and maybe David is, um, maybe this is what he wants his motivation to be. I'm sure there's some selfishness in that prayer, just like there is in all of ours. But he says, God, I want you to preserve my life so that I can keep honoring you, so that I can keep following your commands, so that I can uh, share your love with others. I think that is, uh, that, that really stood out to me as unique from the way that I pray. Maybe that's different from the way that you normally pray as well. He says also in ver that verse, verse 88, he says, listen, I, I, I'm praying that you would do this according to your loving kindness, not mine, not my goodness. I'm praying that you would do this because you're good, not because I deserve it. And so as I wrap up this Devo on prayer, I wanna encourage you with something that I found in that same sermon that I mentioned from Charles Spurgeon. He said this, listen, if you're waiting on God, if you're waiting for him to answer you, if you're in discomfort, you're not being destroyed, but if you're in discomfort, then here is when comfort will come. He gives four points. He says, comfort will come when we put away unbelief. So I encourage you to, to believe God to believe his promises, to believe that he is who he says he is. Then he says, comfort will come when we are finished complaining. And like I said, you, you can complain to God, but don't complain about God. Don't attack God. Don't, don't whine. There's a difference between crying out to God and just whining and complaining. There's a difference. And he says, comfort will come when we put away the sin that we tolerate. Maybe that's sin in your own life. Maybe that's sin in your friend group and you've just been ignoring it, you've just been saying, ah, it's not that big of a deal, ah, it's, everybody does it. Maybe, maybe God's waiting for you to remove that sin from your life or from uh, those around you or to call it out, to stand against it. Comfort will come when you put away the sin that we tolerate. And then finally, comfort will come when we fulfill the duties that we've neglected. I heard somebody tell me one time as I was stepping into this role as youth pastor. I said, I don't feel like I'm, like I'm ready. I don't know that I, I have everything I need. I, I feel kind of unqualified. And that person said to me, they said, listen, here's what you need to do. Pray as if it depends 100% on God and work as if it depends 100% on you. So you gotta meet God halfway. You gotta do everything that you possibly can. Fulfill those duties that he's called you to do. Uh, share the gospel. Reach out to your family that doesn't know the Lord. Um, be obedient in every way that you can, and that is when he's going to meet you the rest of the way. I hope this has been an encouragement to you. I hope that this strengthens your faith. Uh, if you're there in Gainesville, then I hope you guys have a great rest of your night. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to this channel so you can see the next stuff that we're sending your way, and we'll talk to you guys real soon.